just to, to, to tee up the conversation a little bit, you know, we, we asked some of the clients that we have uh, who, who said they'd be able to join today. And I don't know if they're joining for the whiskey or if they're joining for the security, but we definitely got some, some interesting questions that uh, we want to kind of run through with you. I mean, obviously you guys each come from a different perspective um, in the security landscape, but, um, and, and, you know, I, I feel it's important just to, to mention going into this that, you know, everyone is aware that security requires a layered approach and, and you know, no one solution can, you know, substitute for a comprehensive security program. Um, but I think each of your unique perspectives will be interesting. Talked a little bit about AI now and, and governance. We've talked a little bit about um, how people are, are one of our greatest threats. Um, and, you know, obviously one of the things that uh, most businesses will try and do is, you know, look at maybe a zero trust solution. Um, but that comes with a lot of complexity and a lot of change to user behavior, um, complexity in the workforce's daily operation can cause inefficiencies, et cetera. How do you balance that, balance the added time to accomplish tasks with, you know, a potential deployment of zero trust in the organization and, and the security benefits? Uh, let's see. Let's go with uh, Rosanna on that one. So I think it's twofold. I, obviously, we have zero trust products that we can be considering deploying, uh, but we also have principles that we should be following as well. Right. So if you look at CyberSafe, right, when we meet a business, our first job to do is say, well, where do, where do they inherit risk from? Uh, so we talk about best practices. Uh, we talk about what their footprint looks like, what their cloud presence looks like, what their network looks like. And then we have that strategic conversation where we we ask them, you know, are you following things like the principle of least privilege? Are we locking down our environment and not giving access to things that people shouldn't have access to? Right. That's another way of saying that. Uh, in many cases, the answer is no. And that conversation is an afterthought. Right. So. If I go out and buy a zero trust product, but I don't have the foundation that can go ahead and support that, I'm still in the same position. So it's getting the business to understand, all right, we need to be thinking about these things from a visibility standpoint, um, from a data classification standpoint, from a network segmentation standpoint. Now, that doesn't have to be this elaborate process, right? If you were in a large enterprise and you had a larger organization, you'd handle it differently than you would within the SMB. Uh, but those considerations have to be made because buying products and turning things into more alerts without response capability or process to addressing those, that is where companies go wrong. That's why we meet them in incident response, right? It's not that, look at the news, right? Every recent hack that we've seen, the, the vast majority of them have made security investments. So it's not that they didn't have an EDR. It's not that they didn't have you know, a zero trust product. It's that those products might have detected something, but they didn't have the response capability to go ahead and see what it was telling them until damage had already been done. Um, so I'd say a few different pieces um, are worth considering when you think about things like that. I'd agree. Anybody have, have something you want to add? I, I would just say it's a um, kind of like a, a another type of an ROI, John. So where you talk about a return on investment when you buy something, it's a return on investment to the security, right? So turning on zero trust is great provides network segmentation, it's gonna solve things in NIST and CIS and any other type of standard that you look at. But what is the return on investment? How much do you actually get from a gain security posture by adding zero trust, right? If there isn't enough there, to your point about, well, we put it in and work became harder. Well, do you do enough data? Do you have enough issues with identity management? Do you have enough connection of data flows between different systems that that segmentation is actually going to matter? Or are you relatively flat and isolated into your own kind of pods of knowledge and data and things like that anyways? And so what I always say is, is we have to look at this as an a security ROI, not a dollars and cents, but does the increased cost of getting the job done operationally, right? Does that cost give me, give me the value I need from a security standpoint? Because that's definitely what we should be looking at. Yeah. And, and, you know, I think, you know, zero trust can easily dovetail into the sassy conversation. I don't, I don't want to necessarily go there right now. Um, but, you know, one of the other questions that we did get, I think, you know, probably fits here is, you know, as a service model, right? Everything is going to as a service. And if you are in a regulated industry and, you know, there's rapid adoption of the as a service model, every one of your vendors is trying to move to an as a service application. And, you know, we're seeing increasing frequency of supply chain attacks. How, how do you best manage third-party risk tied to those supply chain and SaaS vendors, right? I think um, you have to invest in cloud security solutions. 
Yeah. I mean, I, the, you, we talk about now that every user is a firewall, right? Every user is a threat. And I, I think that you, you have to think about every user, their user ID, the app ID they're using, the, the device ID that they're, they're coming from, and that that access has got to go through a central cloud clearing a clearing house, and that that then it, that's going to control access to SaaS applications. It's going to control access back into your data center applications. Um, and I think the tools are starting to mature enough now where it's becoming manageable and it's becoming useful. It was it was difficult to do that five years ago, but I think now you just have to you have to if you're going to be deploying a ubiquitous security fabric. You're going to have to bite the bullet and look at cloud security solutions. And, and there's, there's, they've matured a lot. There's still probably a couple of them that really rise to the top, and then, and then some pretenders. But I, I think, I think you got to look at cloud security as pretty much being the cornerstone of where we're all headed in the future. Well, I, again, go ahead, Bill. Nope. I was just going to say the other thing I'd add to that is, you know, as we're taking on more adoption of, of as a service is. I think it's really important to know who owns the risk. There's usually a shared risk, provider owns some risk, customer owns some risk, but I, I think we need to look at our at our SaaS contracts or our as a service contracts, uh, ask where their responsibilities end and where yours pick up. Um, and I, I think it needs to be in writing with guarantees where possible. Um, I mean, when I was doing government work, this was drilled into our heads and it had to be yeah. everything that we did, we had to, all right, this 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 particular risk is mitigated by X Y Z from the SaaS provider. This risk is 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 avoided because we're doing this this thing. So it, there's you have to know where your risk lies, and you have to have if somebody else is taking on some of the risk that your business would other otherwise be responsible for. You need to have in writing what those risks are that that uh, your as a service provider is is getting or. or giving you in, in, in part of their contract. I don't completely disagree with you, Bill, but then again, thinking about, I have to buy from Microsoft and Office 365. I've got to buy from Salesforce or, or similar things. I can't control much of their terms and conditions, but I can put some cloud security, HASB solutions in, SaaS security solutions, DLP hangers that hang off of Office 365, et cetera. They're you know, connected via API. I think it's you know, we're. I, th I think in the for the for the near future, we're going to have to talk about. We, we're not going to be able to make Salesforce or Microsoft change what we do, what they do, but we're going to have to add in things to protect. Yeah, for so, sure. It's a it's a three pronged approach. I I, I know I'm, I've said this now a gazillion times. First is the governance level. That's what Bill was speaking to, right? There's actually a process. If you again, if you look at any sort of governance tool, there's a entire entire component called third party uh, vendor risk management. Right. Mm -hmm. And there's an entire component and process that says this is how you should handle any sort of third party risk, whether it be someone like Microsoft, who's not going to change. Their, you're not calling them up and saying, excuse me, I'd like to change my T's and C's all the way down to if I'm coming in and doing work for you guys and what you guys should be doing as my team is taking a login. Right. To come in and work in again with my team doing work with some of the people on this call. Even when my team comes in, what is that third party risk management? Have you calculated that? And is that an understood risk in the business so that you're making decisions that are best for your business? And then there's tier two, which is, I think, what Matt Douglas has hit on, which is going to be using these CASB products, using John's word earlier, he used the word zero trust. More generically, that's called network segmentation. CASB creates a segmentation between cloud providers and you, right? That allows you to set up rules and standards between them, right? So uh, it is a cloud access secure broker, CASB, is actually a tool that creates that segmentation between. I'm sure the ROI for most companies on here that CASB investment probably got a better ROI than a zero trust does for them right now. Uh, and then the third component is, is most major applications, going back to what he's, uh, Matt's statement around Microsoft and Salesforce, release best practices on how you should uh, build out the security of those. Yep. Where you can actually pull that up and go, Microsoft says, if you do these things, you will be more secure. Things like yep. the amount of clients that I go in and see that they're Microsoft, they've not even turned on DLP. They're mm -hmm. not even running... They're not running backups, right? They're not doing any sort of access control. They're probably not going through CASB, right? So you can go through and go, okay, these are the best practices that people should be using. So it's the, it's a three-tiered approach of, do I have that third-party vendor configured accurately? Yes or no. 
right? Do I have a tool creating segmentation in case something goes awry and bump in the knife? And do I have the governance to make sure I'm not signing agreements with bad organizations? And again, it's the, it's the layers to the stinky onion, right? And we're continuing to build more layers to the stinky onion that makes up our security uh, architecture. This is I do, um, I'm sorry, Rosanna, go ahead. Um, I do want to go back to Bill's point, though, because I think it was really important, right? If we think about the government lens, right? When you were going through those evaluations where you needed to say, hey, I have, let's use Microsoft as an example, right? I'm not going to sever my ties with Microsoft because they're not going to listen to my question, right? That's realistic. We all understand that. Uh, but I do think it's important to have that consideration. What happens to me if something happens with Microsoft? Now, let's bring this a little bit more closer to home for businesses. We're not talking about the 10,000 pound gorillas. We're talking about your healthcare providers, um, your technology. If anybody on this call does anything in dental, everything, all, every dental platform is a million years old. If anybody's in manufacturing, all of your operational technology was built for functionality, not security, but it's connected to the internet. So that's the piece that I think that we need to be considering here. Are we going to those vendors and asking them for their internal practices? Right. Again, even if they don't change, you as a business can document that. So when your insurance provider comes and said, what did you do about third party risk? If there ever was something that happened, you can say, well, we asked them about it, right? We talked with them about it. We had that conversation. So one, it's let's not put our heads in the sand because we don't think that it's going to change. Let's recognize where it isn't, but have a safeguard for that. I bet you everybody here remembers a handful of years ago, a very prevalent remote access platform or an RMM essentially had a security event occur. Um, at first, it looked like it was all of the company and then ended up being just one specialized product. I will tell you as a SOC, we had tons of clients. Yes, <laughs> I wasn't going to call them out, but yes, um, we had tons of clients that had that in the environment. Did everybody run to rip and replace it? No, we had to say, how do we know if something bad is happening with this deployment? Can we recognize a behavior that tells us that there's compromise or there's concern? And how do we respond to that before damage can be done, right? So I'd say visibility, along with getting the conversation going, we're never going to be perfect. No one here can give you a silver bullet. You can't buy a product or a tool that puts you in that perfect place. But we certainly can start the conversation to better protect our businesses.